Welcome to the Wigmore Hall for this conversation about Brahms. My name is Natasha Logis, this is my colleague Katie Hamilton, and we're going to talk about Brahms in context. And this is based on a book that we edited together, which came out quite recently, which explored the music and the world and the social life of Brahms in context. So we obviously had to think a great deal about what context meant, and we're going to try and convey some of that to you today. We're delighted to be joined by my husband, the baritone Stefan Logis, and the pianist Simon Lepper. Let's start, Katie, with the idea of private music making, which is where you and I started long ago with our work on Brahms, with the first book that we edited, um, Brahms in the Home and the Concert Hall, which explored that boundary between making music in private and public spaces. People tend, we found, didn't we, to associate Brahms with a very formal and public type of music making. People worry about making mistakes in Brahms. People worry that they're not taking it seriously enough. But we found that there was a whole world of sociability and relaxed music making in Brahms's life, didn't we? Absolutely. And I think um, part of that seriousness and the way we treat his music is perhaps to do with the picture that we have of Brahms. This, mm an older man, misanthropic, perhaps quite lonely, a little bit gruff and grumpy. Bearded. Bearded and <laughs> bellied. Um, and yet, actually, what we, what we found, what's clear from his letters, from diaries and memoirs of his colleagues and his friends, is how important social music making was to his own professional and personal life, and mm. also to 19th century music making in general. And the way in which the, um, the sociable circles and private musical spaces kind of overlap with the more public facing uh, music making that we think about manifested itself in different ways. Everything from private run-throughs of new compositions yes. with professional colleagues, um, so a kind of work purpose in a private space, through to making music for pleasure with professional colleagues, through to making music with or for friends who were amateurs. And the fact that they were amateurs did not necessarily mean they were not very skilled musicians themselves, even if that was not um, what they did for a living. They might have been industrialists, art historians, surgeons. Um, and all of those people, and indeed their specialisms, ended up informing the way that Brahms made music, and in some cases he took very seriously the opinions of his friends as he was crafting new compositions ready for publication and performance. So we were trying to see this in our imaginations, weren't we? It sounds, it sounds so idyllic, this idea of people of all levels of musical proficiency gathered around a piano and enjoying simply the making of music at whatever level they were able to. And it reminds me very strongly of the image that we see when we walk into the Wigmore Hall now of the very, very famous Schubertiade. And we see little Schubert sitting at the piano stool, his friend pressed up close beside him singing, and everybody around them in a tight circle. So is this a bit of a fantasy? Do we know from the evidence what these experiences were like in Brahms's day? So this is fast forwarding 40 or so years. Well, I think the, the piano in the centre is important, and we have yeah. indeed the piano in the centre today as well, because um, a lot of domestic music making seems to have centred about around piano music, whether that be solo mm. or duet or working with other musicians, singers or chamber musicians. Um, the Schubertiaden provide quite an, a useful model in that sometimes it's clear that performances with, with the Schubert Circle were quite spontaneous, but sometimes they were quite de decently planned. Mm -hmm. And we have, surviving from um, Brahms's Circle, printed programs of evenings that were obviously planned and put together in advance for a circle of friends to come over, perhaps have dinner, often food and wine, um, conversation, there might have been poetry reading as well as performance of pieces. Um, and sometimes um, we get right to the other end, the most informal end of the spectrum where it really does seem as if you know people come round to have dinner and then end up going to the piano in order to kind of have a jolly time once they finish their food. Yeah, people, um... I'm just comparing it to the way in which Brahms's music is experienced nowadays more often, where activities are separated out very neatly. So even though in a concert hall you can have a drink, you can probably have your dinner, 
the experiences of doing that and seeing your friends and sitting in the hall and experiencing the music are quite separate. I think what I find very appealing when I read those memoirs of social music making in Brahms's circle is that it was a little bit messy, it was a little bit free flowing, the activities might be going on simultaneously and perhaps that allowed for a greater relaxation uh, perhaps also one of the things I love is that if you heard something and you really enjoyed it you could just ask for it again uh, without worrying you could just say can we please have that one again and of course the musicians would oblige they loved operating in that environment too yeah and people would recharge glasses bring food we have a very lovely anecdote from um, a friend of Brahms Otilia Ebner uh, writing about one of the soirees that she held where she uh, she made food, she had friends round, but also there was music making and she performed for her guests. And she recalls in her diary, I felt like singing and sang one Schubert lead after another. Some I accompanied myself and some a friend of hers played for. While the assembled company ate steamed noodles, I sang Der Doppelgänger and everyone lost their appetite. I think um, if the audience doesn't know Der Doppelgänger, they should go away and uh, find it immediately and listen to it and imagine consuming steamed noodles to something so bleak and desolate. No wonder they lost their appetite. Exactly. But it's quite, it's, it's quite sweet, really, to imagine them being able to do that, to, being able to mix those activities in such a relaxed way, perhaps in a way that we would now watch television, but certainly not in a way that we attend concerts. Brahms, of course, had a very large public music making life as well, but this was an exciting counterpart, counterpoint to that activity for us to discover, wasn't it? Absolutely, and clearly the other thing that emerged over the course of putting these books together was that there were, although the circle in its kind of grandest form was very, very large indeed, um, there were kind of core members of, that, of the social group, professional and indeed just close friends who were very interested in music, who were pivotal in Brahms' development and his education, and also you know, getting in contact with particular poetry sources that he was not previously familiar with, in some cases the poets themselves. Mm. And the first and most important meeting, for sure, is um, the meeting when Brahms is 20 years old in 1853 with the Schumann family, which is such an, a kind of watershed moment professionally and personally. Absolutely, and that was why really we had to commission a separate chapter to talk about the Schumanns, and I think we, we could really barely scrape the surface of how complex that relationship was. I think um, audience members might be familiar with the story of Brahms's romance with Clara Schumann, and um, you and I know that there isn't that much evidence to support that, although it is a great story. But what we do know is that when Brahms met the Schumanns, he was exposed to Robert Schumann's library. And that opened an entire intellectual world to him that he'd previously not experienced. He'd always been a book lover. He bought books avidly as a teenager, but having access to the Schumann's book collection, Schumann was of course the son of a bookseller, was, um, a way of him learning to function in that cultivated world. So it wasn't that just that you knew your trade as a musician, but that you could understand how music intersected with, as you say, literature, poetry, the visual arts and the behaviors that go with that. So that was one of the things that he learned from being with the Schumanns. He also learned from Clara Schumann how to be a professional, uh, which is something bizarrely enough that Robert Schumann was not very good at teaching anyone how to be given the you know the sort of veering between shambles and chaos of his own professional life it was Clara Schumann who taught Brahms how to work within that professional world nevertheless Schumann Robert Schumann was artistically very important for Brahms we keep on finding reminiscences of Schumann's music in Brahms's work. So we wanted to start musically with um, what the Germans call Parallelvertonungen, the setting of the same text. And in this case, it is Josef von Eichendorff's Mondnacht, one of Schumann's most famous songs already by then, which Brahms as a very, very young man made a, a very tender and intimate and um, on, what's the word I'm looking for, a guileless setting, which we have juxtaposed with Schumann's here to um, try and show you how the younger and the more mature musicians' worlds overlap. 
Eichendorff was one of the most important of romantic poets, evoking that ger particularly Germanic world of moonlight and forests and mystery. And I just love hearing how these two different composers interpret that world differently. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's talk now about one of Brahms's best-loved pieces of music, a piece that many people know, even if they don't know that it's by Brahms. And of course, I'm talking about the lullaby. This is a good story, Katie, so I'll let you tell it. Thank you kindly. <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting one because it has really quite a long history, this piece. And also, um, it leads us across various different platforms of music making and even musical genres. So. The origins of this piece date back to 1859. Brahms was mm -hmm. still living in Hamburg, um, and he was conducting an amateur female voice choir that met in the homes of its members. And in 1859, a young girl from Vienna came to visit her friends in Hamburg and ended up singing briefly with the choir, a girl called Berta Porubski. She was terribly pretty. Brahms probably had a bit of a crush on her. And Berta Porubski sang songs for Brahms um, that she particularly liked, which included a waltz song by a composer called Alexander Baumann. She then went back to Vienna, and of course, a number of years later, Brahms moved to Vienna. By the time they were back in touch, Berta Porubski had married a rather rich industrialist called Arthur Faber. Yes, she was very sensible not to marry Brahms, didn't she? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and when the father's second child was born, second son, Brahms created a lullaby that he gave to the fathers as a present, the vegan lead that we know so well. And woven into the melody of the vegan lead is uh, a reminiscence of the waltz song by Baumann that Berta had sung to Brahms all those years earlier. Um, and indeed, it became very quickly, once it had moved from being a private gift mm. into the public sphere when Brahms mm -hmm. had it published um, as part of his Opus 49 song collection, it became a big hit and it was arranged for all manner of instruments and vocal forces, which is um, a kind of an, an important marker for us as music historians as to the pieces that were the most successful is the sheer, sheer number of arrangements that were made. So this piece was arranged for solo piano, for piano duet, for flute and violin, for male voice choir, for orchestra, for harp, for zither, you know, all kinds of combinations. And eventually when Brahms came to write his second symphony, he sneaked the vegan lead theme into the first movement, but in the minor key, and he joked with his publisher that he was sending a theme for naughty or sickly children that he'd put into the symphony. So it's a piece that begins life as having a very personal, private connection mm -hmm. for performance at home to a little baby, and then moves into the public sphere as um, a printed song as a, a piece that can be arranged for countless different forces and then finally that makes its way onto the concert platform in a symphonic version and we're going to hear it as it would have been sung to the to the little baby father uh, for voice and piano Guten Abend. 
So when we think of a vegan lead, we tend to think of female singer. We tend to mm. think, you know, immediately we kind of gender the song. And perhaps mm. that's something we'll come back to later about the fluidity of performance versus um, poetry, mm. gender presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly the case and certainly something that we have explored a bit in both of our books, in fact, that there were many um, very talented women, both as performers and as composers, whose music and whose performing life we, we don't really know very much about um, anymore. We don't tend to hear that music. Um, and we were very keen to at least introduce our audience to one of those composers, and that's Josefina Lang. So, Natasha, tell us a bit about this, this wonderful composer. Josefina Lang, it's a little bit heartbreaking, this story. And I think if you and I were to start our earlier book, Brahms in the Home in the Concert Hall, again, it might we might have made more of an effort to integrate the many women composers who were operating in Brahms's day. Um, I keep discovering more and more of these women's music and thinking, how come I didn't know that? How come I didn't come across that? And Josefina Lang is a classic example of this. And she had a, a, a very difficult life um, because she was widowed quite young with a great brood of children, exactly like Clara or Schumann, but she didn't have the benefit of having an established professional career. So she had to make her living by teaching from morning till evening and then socializing, effectively pro professionally socializing in the evening in order to make contacts with the kinds of families who would send their daughters for music lessons. So she had a very exhausting life and somewhere in the middle of all of that, she did manage to write a great many songs. And what is lovely about this is that her more successful professional colleagues um, recognized her tremendous gifts. Uh, so Clara Schumann was a great supporter of hers and also the composer and conductor Ferdinand Hiller. The Mendelssohn family supported Josefina Lang to the extent that when she actually had to put a plea out for financial help, those were the friends who rallied around her and supported her um, as she then eventually died. She did not really... Uh, she didn't really have the fame, I think, that she deserved. But I'm so glad that now we have an opportunity to find those songs and hear them again. Now, Brahms had a very special connection to Josefina Lang because her youngest daughter, bear with me, her youngest daughter, Maria, moved to Vienna and married a successful industrialist, Richard Fellinger, who worked for the company Siemens. So eventually, Maria Fellinger, as she became, uh, the family became very prosperous. They owned a beautiful house, which hosted many, many evenings of music making and feeding and socializing, all of the things that we've been talking about. And she took some of the most wonderful photographs of Brahms that we have late in his life, very, very relaxed sort of snapshot type photographs, which are very, very different from the stern and still and static types of photographs that we associate with the 19th century. And um, we've got one here, which was a particular favorite of ours, where Brahms is sitting outside her house, smiling in a basket chair and looking absolutely relaxed and very pleased with himself. So we wanted to feature Josefina Lang's music today because so few people are yet, and we hope to encourage musicians and listeners to explore and get a bigger sense of what that musical milieu around Brahms was like, not just him, Schubert and Schumann, but a whole host of other figures. So let's listen to her setting of Lenau's Schilflied now. Mein Liebstes meinen Quill, o Träne Quill hervor. Traurig säusen hier die Weiden, und im Winde pitt das Rohr. 
It's wonderful to hear the Josefina Lang song, Schilflied. Um, like the other songs that we've heard so far today, this is all music that is very much suitable for a domestic setting, precisely because it's one pianist, one singer. But it's also the case that much larger scale repertoire was made available in versions that would suit a domestic performance. So let's think about a rather different piece of Brahms now, a very large-scale work, uh, his Requiem, Ein Deutsches Requiem. And let's have a listen to this. This is an excerpt from the third movement in a reduction for one singer and one pianist. <laughs> Das 
I wonder if it's strange for the audience to hear such a grand and dramatic and overwhelming piece on such a small scale, um, particularly with the choral voices missing. But I suspect that people would have ghosted them in because they would have known how it went. People did know how things went in a different way because they would have played it themselves in precisely that kind of format. This piece, The Requiem, was written with one particular singer in mind, uh, certainly for the, for the male part, and this was the baritone Julius Stockhausen, who was hugely important to Brahms's music making. I think we found, didn't we, in the course of both books, that although we think, or we tend to think of composers as quite monolithic and isolated, all of their composition is shaped by the interactions that they have with the musicians around them, be they famous instrumentalists, or in this case, a very famous singer, who also happened to be a first-class conductor and all-round professional, a very impressive man, Julius Stockhausen. Perhaps not typical of the kinds of singers that Brahms tended to favor. Altogether, I think when I imagine Brahms' over as a whole, the gap that is there is the opera gap. He never wrote an opera, but this is not for want of trying. I think, you know, we would like to think that he simply avoided opera because he thought it was silly and frivolous, but that was not the case. He spent nearly two decades trying to find the right libretto from Italian folk tales to pirate fantasies. He went through all sorts of things looking for the right libretto and he never found the one that sort of set him off. As a result, his engagement with singers tended to be with concert singers, people who made their careers in a different shape. There's one exception, but I won't dwell on her here. Um, this is the gorgeous Alice Barbi, who was Italian and Italian trained and also very beautiful. And yes, he probably also had a crush on her. So that's why I won't dwell on her. <laughs> but let's return to Stockhausen and that circle. Another really important function that all of those musicians had in Brahms's life was that they traveled. And Brahms did not really like traveling. He traveled within Austria, Germany. He went on eight holidays to Italy, but his comfort zone geographically was quite small, wasn't it, Katie? So he really relied on musicians who had to travel for concert making in order to have his repertoire promoted. And let's dwell for a moment longer on the Requiem in the context of our own city of London. Yeah, and here Stockhausen was a really crucial figure in bringing the piece to the UK. Brahms never came to England. Um, whereas Stockhausen did more than once. Mm. And whilst the premiere of the Requiem with choir and orchestra had happened in 1869, um, it's not until a couple of years later in 1871 that um, the first performance of the piece is given in this country, but it is not the case that that first performance was also for choir and orchestra. In fact, it's, if you like, full premiere in London was not until 1873. But in 1871, just around the corner from here on Wimpole Street, there was a performance of the Requiem with two pianists, so with piano duet, a small choir, and two soloists. And one of those soloists who was responsible for organizing the performance and indeed conducting it was Stockhausen. And Stockhausen had brought with him a reduction of the score that Brahms had made himself just for piano duet, no singers, just piano duet. Mm -hmm. And in the score, um, the text of the vocal parts is marked. So we happen to have surviving the copy that was used for this performance on mm. Wimpole Street. And it's clear that Stockhausen and his colleagues went through, crossed out the vocal doublings so that it was then possible to add the choir, add in the baritone and soprano solo parts without the whole thing becoming overburdened with what was written into the piano part. Mm. And that meant that it's a rather lovely hybrid of a kind of sanctioned arrangement mm -hmm. on the one hand that's mm -hmm. then been adapted for purpose for this performance. Um, the, the two pianists were both professional pianists, mm -hmm. Kate Loder and Cipriani. Cipriani Potter, and it was Kate Loder's house mm -hmm. on Wimpole Street where this performance took place. And in fact, the performance that we've just heard of the opening of the third movement, 
was constructed on exactly similar lines because Simon was playing from a solo piano only arrangement of the Requiem by a man called Theodor Kirchner, a composer and a serial arranger of Brahms's works. Mm. He was responsible for a lot of piano reductions of Brahms's music. Mm. And in exactly the same way, Stefan and Simon, as it were, crossed out the doublings, the text is in the part, so that the baritone solo can be added in. So it's, it's lovely in that we have both this kind of, this flexibility of um, ensemble that is expected. This is a pre-recording age. If you want to encounter this music, the reality is that you're very likely to do so in a format that is not what we consider to be the correct or original Form. Yeah, and that's the form that you might actually encounter a hundred or two hundred times in comparison to the one large-scale orchestral or cho orchestral choral performance that you're going to encounter. So it's as if you have a sort of palimpsest experience of the piece, don't you? All of those different versions overlaying in your brain, um, sung in your body, played under your hands, heard in the ear in a more formal space, and they all collectively make up that picture of what the piece is. It's a very different way of experiencing music, isn't it? It is, and it's something that Brahms, of course, was himself extremely aware of, yeah. which is one of the reasons why not only did he make arrangements of his music himself and mm. also sanction arrangements by people like Kirchner. Obviously, there's partly a kind of market forces element here because... Yeah, he did grumble about them, didn't he? He did, but also, <laughs> you know, in order for a piece like that to reach a big audience, yeah. it was necessary to have those arrangements precisely because concert performances would have been rare and expensive. Yes. Um, but it, it is one of the many um, moments of care that Brahms clearly took with the way in which a piece of music was conceived. Everything from um, the instrumentation that he might have come up with for the first version through to how it would sit idiomatically in other versions. And something else that he was clearly very, very careful with, and the Requiem is a particular example of this, is text selection. Because mm -hmm. one of the things about the Requiem that you know really sets it apart from most of the other big 19th century choral pieces that we know is that Brahms selected text himself from a range of different books of the Bible and it, the text is in German in the vernacular rather than being in Latin. He refers to the Bible as being the source of his poets when he's talking yeah. about this piece as mm -hmm. well. So given the fact that this is one example of Brahms's um, care and attention to detail when it came to literary sources, perhaps we could talk a bit more about his, his other non-sacred poets. Brahms and literature, this is one of those juxtapositions which endlessly fascinates me because people don't think of him as literary. They think of him as somebody who operates best in the abstract realm of notes. But this is only, I think, because the music history that we inherit tends to give a very partial picture of what people's actual lives were like, what their contexts were, so to speak. So Brahms's was a very, very literary age. People self-consciously sought to, um, to educate themselves through the medium of print publication. And there were thousands of ways that they could do this. So of course they could buy books and that's great, but there were also reams and reams of newspapers through which people could encounter the latest poets, the latest trends in thought, and by the by, could also read the music criticism and the political news and whatever else was going on. So again, it's this amalgamation of different kinds of activity, which means that you absorb those literary trends quite naturally. Um, that doesn't mean that there were no hierarchies, and Brahms was conscious of when he was reading popular literature and when he was reading what he had inherited as great literature. And there was no figure whose greatness was more apparent in Brahms's day than Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who I think our audience members will remember from countless Fausts and uh, the Wilhelm Meister, the unreadable Wilhelm Meister novel, um, The Sorrows of Young Werther. So we, we know Goethe through opera and through many, many other media. Brahms took Goethe very seriously. And um, I think one of the landmark events in Brahms's day was when Goethe's grandson finally made Goethe's literary legacy available to scholars. And it was like a treasure chest being opened and these thousands, hundreds upon thousands of words being made available to this hungry audience. So Brahms approached Goethe with respect 
and a little bit of trepidation, he tended to save his setting of Goethe for large scale and public works in, in keeping with the poet's dignity as it was perceived. But I think we're very lucky that he also set a handful of solo songs of Goethe, including the one that we're about to hear, Dämmerung senkte sich von oben. Um, Goethe wrote this poem when he was nearly 80. So he was coming to the point where Brahms was about to be born, so to speak. He was at the end of his writing life. And he collected it, that particular poem, as one of 14 in what he called the Chinese German book of seasons and hours. Chinese German, which is again, not a juxtaposition that I associate either with Goethe or with Brahms. But this is one of the things which literature allowed Brahms to do, which was to travel without leaving his living room. I think of Brahms now, possibly a little bit unkindly, as a, a bit of a geographical coward. He liked his comforts. He liked his creature comforts. He liked being in an environment that he could control, down to the brewing of his own coffee in the morning and the timing of the walks that he took that punctuated his day and the sorts of places that he went on holiday, which are really of a type, aren't they, Katie? He tended to favor certain kinds of spaces. But through literature, such as these Chinese German poems, he could allow his mind to range free through a language that he was comfortable with. He didn't speak any other languages, although there are good stories about him trying to speak Italian on holiday and failing as so many of us do. So let's hear that song now and imagine that we are traveling in spirit with Brahms. Thank you. 
So we've, we've just heard a setting of a great German poet, of mm -hmm. Goethe, but the texts that Brahms uh, was drawn to were not always of quite such noble pedigree, were they? No, indeed, but this is a really fascinating point that you open because in Brahms's day, people regarded folk music and folk poetry as something very, very precious. So while it doesn't partake of that sort of formal um, virtuosity that we can see in the Goethe setting and the Goethe poem, Goethe's own text, people placed enormous value in that direct, simple charm that was held to belong in that world of folk culture. Now, whether the folk, as people thought about them, had anything to do with the actual people on the street, is a different question and one that is far too complicated for us to unpack here. But they did have this idealized picture of the common man, somebody who doesn't have to hide behind artifice, somebody who speaks in rhythms that we can easily memorize, somebody whose melodies ring in our ears for hours, having only heard them once or twice. And Brahms, I think he regarded the whole cultural world around him as a treasure chest, something that he could open and plunder as he chose. So one of the things that he spent a lot of time in his early 20s doing was copying out folk tunes and folk poems. And eventually he made a series of arrangements of those folk songs. Now, some people grumbled about them because they said, oh, well, they're, they're far too sophisticated and, you know, the accompaniments are far too clever, clever. They don't, you know, they're not really part of that vernacular. Brahms, of course, didn't give a hoot. He did exactly what he wanted. And you can sense that play of that creative mind underneath these very, very simple and appealing melodies that anyone, ha ha, anyone could sing who could hold a tune. And you also get the sense of him deliberately writing accompaniments which are very playable, um, that could be memorized, and that could be then brought out and enjoyed in any context where a keyboard and a willing singer was available. So let's hear one of those now. It's one of my great, great favorites, Erlaube mir feins Mädchen, a song of unashamed flirtation. Erlaube mir feins Mädchen in den Garten zu gehen, dass ich dort mag schauen, wie die Rosen so schön Erlaube sie zu brechen, es ist die höchste Zeit, ihre Schönheit, ihre Jugend hat mir mein Herz erfreut. O Mädchen, o Mädchen, du einsames Kind, Wer hat den Gedanken ins Herz dir gezwind, dass ich soll den Garten die Rosen nicht sehen? Du gefällst meinen Augen, das muss ich gestehen. Isn't that just one of the most charming things? I find it utterly seductive, that, that whole melody, the whole setup um, of that song. But folk song arrangements were also an opportunity for Brahms to be a little bit silly and to have a little bit of fun and to set the kinds of texts that you might not necessarily otherwise allow yourself to sing in polite company. And we really wanted to show the audience one of those today as well. This is Och Morde, Ich will ein Ding haben. Um, and the girl who is singing this poem tells us what the thing is that she wants quite clearly by the end of the song. We chose, however, to have um, Stefan sing this song today. Um, and of course, Stefan is a man. 
we wanted to do that on purpose because we kept on finding evidence, didn't we, of people singing things outside their gender. In some ways, we've become much more strict today about what we think is right or wrong on the stage. So we have examples of female singers singing uh, the big Schubert song cycles, Winterreise, Die Schöne Müllerin. And equally, we have examples of men singing things like Frauenliebe und Leben way back in the 1860s, which still causes people to you know, give a, um, a sigh of disapproval nowadays. So let's enjoy that gender-bending performance now. Och mor, ich will ein Ding haben, was für ein Ding, mein Herz ins Kind, ein Ding, ein Ding. Weißt du dann ein Pöpfchen haben? Nee, Mutter, nee, er sieht kein Gode, Mutter, er könnt das Ding nicht rode, was das Kind für ein Ding will haben, Ding, der Ding, Ding, Ding. Ich will ein Ding haben, was für ein Ding, mein Herz ins Kind, ein Ding, ein Ding. Willst du dann ein Ring schön haben? Nee, Mutter, nee, er sieht kein Gode, Mutter, er könnte das Ding nicht rode, was das Kind für ein Ding will haben, Ding, der Ding, Ding, Ding. Och, Mutter, ich will ein Ding haben, Was für ein Ding, mein Herz ins Kind, ein Ding, ein Ding. Willst du dann ein Kleid schön haben? Nee, Mutter, nee, er sieht kein Gode, Mutter, er könnt das Ding nicht rode, was das Kind für ein Ding will haben, Ding, der Ding, Ding, Ding. Och, Mutter, ich will ein Ding. What for a thing, my heart's in skin, and ding, and ding. Will you then in a man? Yeah, mother, yeah. Er sieht ein Gode, mother. Er könnt das Ding bei Rode. Was das Kind für ein Ding will haben. Ding, der Ding, Ding, Ding. So Brahms published the folk songs that we've just heard as arrangements. He didn't want himself identified on the front cover as being the composer because, of course, the melodies already existed. Mm -hmm. there, are, right. there are also examples of pieces um, where Brahms was his own mm -hmm. arranger so that a piece might appear um, simultaneously in several different versions. Yes. And we're going to hear one of those now, which is um, one of the waltzes for piano opus 39. Um, now, arranging is such an important part, and we've touched on this already, of um, 19th century musical life, mm. precisely in order to allow a musically literate public, and that is something that really cannot be underestimated, that middle and upper class, uh, and indeed working class audiences as well, had some musical literacy which meant that this music could be made available to a broader audience mm. rather than us just sitting and listening. So the waltzes um, are written in the 1860s, um, not so long after Brahms has come to Vienna and a great fuss is made when they are published about the fact that this kind of uh, gruff North German has arrived in Vienna and this must be the thing that has sparked his uh, creativity into, into the creation of this set of waltzes, which was dedicated to um, a notable Viennese critic, Edward Hanslick. But what's quite striking about the waltzes is that whilst we perhaps know them best in their version for piano duet, there are actually three versions, all for piano, but in addition to the piano duet version, a version for solo piano that is, as it were, difficult, yes. and then a version that, that Brahms uh, called the kind of the children's edition, the, the version that he thought was particularly suitable for lady pianists. Yes, were... terribly patronizing, <laughs> but we will forgive him, won't we? We will, because he did know some very, very accomplished um, female, female pianists, pianists who could play many, many difficult pieces. Um, so these, these three versions, of course, meant a larger income yeah. from the piece, 
But they also, again, as with um, you know, the Requiem in reduced form, they made it available to more performers. Mm -hmm. um, and Simon has very kindly agreed to play for us one of the difficult solo arrangements um, of the fifth waltz in this sequence. <laughs> Now, there's an additional rather special thing about this particular waltz from Opus 39, which is that the melody Brahms composed for the dance, he also used in another composition that he was working on at pretty much the same time. In fact, we're not quite sure which piece came first. And that is a piece for four solo singers and piano, a vocal quartet with piano mm -hmm. called Der Gang zum Liebchen. And it's not the only example of Brahms sort of sneaking melodies from one piece into another. Indeed, we've already heard about the vegan lead turning up in the second symphony. Mm. Um, the next song that we're going to hear performed is another piece that um, kind of crosses musical genres. And that is um, one of two songs which within their own opus indeed have the same melody, a song called Nachklang. Um, and this is one of two settings that Brahms puts side by side in a sim single opus of um, poems by a, a colleague, a fellow North German and a friend of his, Klaus Groth. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, the, the second, we have Regenlied and then Nachklang, um, both, as the name suggests, both poems about rain falling in the first case, um, childhood memories of watching the rain falling outside and sort of standing dry in the doorway and singing songs and the, the naivety, the innocence of youth. Mm. In Nachklang, um, a rather more um, melancholy and slightly uh, potentially mm. um, kind of heartbroken Yes, a darker, a darker and more resigned and melancholic song, certainly. Yeah, and the, the, the tears falling on the, the protagonist's cheeks, um, matching the, the pitter-patter of rain outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and perhaps it's this, it's this kind of this heartbreak, this melancholy, and perhaps also the reference to uh, the younger self in Regenlied, which prompted Brahms to include this song um, as a melody in the finale of his first violin sonata in G major. And in fact, the song in the last movement comes to form the basis of the musical construction of the first and second movements. And that certainly brings to mind a composer to whom Brahms was greatly inde indebted, Franz Schubert, yes. who in so many uh, works took a song as a starting point within an instrumental piece that is then constructed around it. So lovers of the violin repertoire will recognize this song as the finale where it's quoted almost exactly in the violin sonata. But we hear now Stefan and Simon performing Nachklang. <laughs> Yeah. 
we should bring this to a close, shouldn't we? <laughs> we could do this for hours, that's we the problem. We could do this for hours, but we are going to bring this to a close by asking now, what do we, as musicians, as music lovers, make of all of this? It's, it's quite a bewilderingly messy world, isn't it? There's lots and lots of different things going on at the same time. All of our hierarchies are upset by the kinds of music making that we found in the creation of both of those books. So, you know, we have, the, what are the key themes that we are left with, with all of this? Well, I think one of them is the fact that so many people could be users of this music in mm. the sense of actually making it themselves. Um, and that, that goes for amateur composers and improvisers, as well yeah. as those who were playing arrangements at home, playing original versions at home. Um, you know, there are, of course, those among us who do still make music at home for pleasure, but it's a much smaller percentage of the population now who has that level of musical literacy yeah. to be able to understand the scores. And it's, it's the growing kind of gap between um, the music makers and the audiences that has perhaps caused us to lose perspective on some of what was going on at, at the time that Brahms was writing. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a shame, really, because if we if we only think of when we think of Brahms, we only think of something like the piano quintet, which is formidable. It's a horrifically difficult piece to play. We might then forget all the rest of the context that we've tried to bring in today. Um, all of that music, which really somebody of not enormous musical skill can enjoy and take a great deal of pleasure from. And I think the other thing which we'd love to leave our audience with today is this idea of a concert being a version of making music with friends, that ultimately music is a social, a sociable act. It's something that draws us together around which we can forge our relationships. And in a different way, that could take place in the concert hall, couldn't it? It could, and it, indeed it did. Um, certainly something that we see right through the 19th century and into the early 20th well century, 20th, yeah. well into the 20th century, is miscellany programming. And indeed the early years of programs at Wigmore Hall reflect mm. this very nicely of you know, concerts where one would have vocal items, piano items, perhaps a violinist who would join the party as well, so that you had a real kind of, um, like a sort of selection box, a sort of sweetie selection box yeah. of lots of different kinds of music making in a convivial spirit within a single gathering. And the other thing to say about those, those early years of the Bechstein Hall, as it, as it then was as it here, then was, yeah. um, is how many of the musicians that performed here were in some ways associated with Brahms. Yeah. Singers that he knew and worked with, um, piano students of Clara Schumann, who were responsible for giving the British premieres yes. of a number of Brahms's piano works, mm. um, and you know, and others, uh, others who were familiar with his repertoire from having travelled to Germany and Austria and worked with him. So there's a very, very strong connection between um, Brahms's social circle and music making in this country, where his music was extremely popular. Yes, we can still hear that legacy today, can't we, in spaces just like this one. So I think what we have tried to do, and I hope what we've managed to do, is not so much to correct a picture of Brahms. It's not that he isn't a consummate professional able to write large-scale orchestral pieces and, you know, quite demanding chamber works which take 40 minutes to listen to, but that he is also a whole range of other things and has his eye open to a whole range of other audiences which I think can include us in ways that we might not always remember. Would you agree with that? I would, and I think, you know, these, these, these two books that we've, that we've put together have made very clear the amount of musical terrain there is still to explore, Absolutely. actually. Um, as, as researchers, as scholars, but also as audience members mm -hmm. and as performers. And I think, you know, we've heard some wonderful vocal performances today and Brahms wrote so many songs um, that the more we have the opportunity to hear as broad a range of those songs as possible rather than you know the kind of the eight or nine favorites which is exactly what's led to this slightly narrower idea of what mm. his leader and his output are about the more we will come to gain a fully rounded picture of him as composer as professional music maker but also as convivial music maker with friends absolutely i couldn't agree more
Thank you so much for joining us today, and huge thank you to Stefan and Simon for performing for us as well. We hope that this has opened some new perspectives for you on Brahms, his music, and his musical world, and we look forward to exploring it a little bit more with you when we next meet again at Wigmore Hall. <laughs>